Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Welcome back to another 118th scale model car review of this, brought to us by Mattel Hot Wheels, the Ferrari F2007, rendered in 118th scale, as driven by Kimi Raikkonen in the 2007 Formula One season. The 2007 season, it's one that we remember for a lot of change at the front of the grid in terms of driver and team associations, as well as a lot of controversy at the front of the grid in terms of Ferrari versus McLaren versus a copy machine someplace in England. Yes, of course, Spygate. Yes, of course, the blackmail game between Fernando Alonso and McLaren. Yes, of course, the intramural struggle between Fernando Alonso and Lewis Hamilton fighting for team leader position at McLaren as well as for P1 in the World Championship, which neither man ultimately achieved because this man, Kimi Raikkonen, in the F2007 managed to steal the World Championship at the final race, the Brazilian Grand Prix, winning the World Championship finally by just one point after coming oh so close to doing it in 2003 and 2005. However, the Ferrari F2007, it therefore picks up the dubious distinction of being the last Ferrari Formula One car to win a driver's championship, and it is the penultimate Ferrari Formula One car to date to win the constructor's championship. The F2008 would also win the constructor's championship in the following year. However, that's something that Ferrari have not managed to do since 2008. And really, this car building on the momentum that Ferrari had through the early part of the 2000s with Michael Schumacher, Ross Braun, and John Tutt spearheading their multi-year championship success. The F2007 represented the end of that parade for the most part, and certainly the end of the era of Ferrari winning both of the championships at the end of the season. One more Constructors' Championship to come, but to date, that's it. I remember the F2007 for being Kimi Raikkonen's first Ferrari and for being, of course, Kimi Raikkonen's world championship winner. And, of course, you can't not like a driver like Kimi Raikkonen and for him to have won just one world championship. Perhaps you can say he didn't get quite enough out of his Formula One career. He certainly deserved at least one more in my estimation. But he still managed to get one, and he has one because of the F2007. This model is an older one. I've had it for quite a long time. It is a 2007 model of a 2007 car, so it is a period piece. And, well, it is a survivor in the collection, but still in pretty good shape, as we shall see. However, sit back and relax, and let's take a look at the Ferrari F2007 here by Mattel. The Ferrari F2007, to date it remains the last Ferrari Formula One car to win the Formula One Drivers' Championship, and it is the penultimate Ferrari Formula One car to win the Formula One Constructors' Championship. 2007, the season represented a bit of a paradigm shift for Formula One. Michael Schumacher had retired in 2006, he had left his Ferrari team thereby doing, and, well, we were seeing big changes at the front of the grid. Kimi Raikkonen was new to Ferrari, replacing Michael Schumacher as team leader de facto, although Massa had the red T-bar on top of his car. Fernando Alonso had left Renault, with whom he had won two world championships back-to-back -back in 2005 and 2006, and he had departed that team for McLaren, who were looking to make good after their first winless season to date in a decade in 2006, the MP421 having a lot of reliability concerns, building on really the debacle that started with the MP418 for the 2003 season. However, Lewis Hamilton, there's a name that we haven't heard a whole lot about in, in the years past, but he was new to Formula One as well, going to McLaren as a rookie. So. All change at the front of the grid. Michael Schumacher was gone. Kimi Raikkonen going to Ferrari. Fernando Alonso leaving Renault and going to McLaren. And Lewis Hamilton, fresh out of GP2, going to partner Fernando Alonso at McLaren. The gravitas that was the presence of Michael Schumacher on the grid was gone. And in its wake, we had one of the most exciting drivers of his generation, Kimi Raikkonen, replacing him in that seat at Ferrari and we had the double reigning world champion going to McLaren. So all change in 2007 on the driver front. Some changes on the technical front for 2007 as well. 
probably the biggest change relative to 2006, we had two things. One, the 2.4 liter V8s that were introduced in the 2006 season, they were now going to be more or less frozen. We had basically free engine development in 2006, provided that you kept it with the 2.4 liter V8. However, for 2007, a mandatory 19,000 RPM rev limit was being instituted. So no more were the teams going to be trying to push the revs past 20,000. Couldn't do it any longer. This was done in the name of reliability, which was done in the name of cost saving. So effectively an engine freeze coming in beginning in 2006, and we would see these engine specifications more or less frozen all the way through the end of the V8 era at the end of the 2013 season. So 2007, a big technical shift in the engine department. Also a big technical shift came in the tire department. 2006 was the last year for Formula One's tire war between Bridgestone and Michelin. Michelin had started to fall out of favor in the eyes of the FIA after the debacle that was the 2005 United States Grand Prix at Indianapolis wherein all the Michelin shod teams withdrew after the formation lap. However, the writing was on the wall in 2006 as well. Michelin, they decided that they were going to pull out of Formula One. I'm sure they did that with some encouragement from the FIA. And Bridgestone were announced as being Formula One's sole tire supplier beginning in the 2007 season. For 2007, Bridgestone, rather than trying to develop the fastest possible tire for their teams as they would have been doing during the tire war, Bridgestone were instructed to build a tire that was durable. They wanted to give all cars a consistent baseline tire that they could rely on that would give them good data and give them a stable platform to develop from. So Bridgestone duly obliged. Bridgestone, of course, were also ordered to make several different compounds of tires. So we had super soft, soft, mediums, and hards in this era. And we went through a bit of a polemic in terms of how do we signify the difference between the compounds. Ultimately, it was decided to paint a white stripe through one of the grooves in the tread block surface of the tires. However, remember for the Australian Grand Prix, that was not done yet, and we had a quarter, U.S. quarter coin sized white dot painted on the sidewalls of the soft compound tires for the benefit of the TV audience. So if anybody knows exactly which compounds were run by every driver in the 2007 Australian Grand Prix, please let me know because I still don't know to this day. Thank you very much, FIA, and your unbelievable ability to waffle about on absolutely nothing at all. However, for all of these reasons, 2007 presented a little bit of a design challenge for all of the teams, not the least of which were Ferrari. Ferrari's 2006 car, the 248 F1, it was a good car, and up until the Japanese Grand Prix at Suzuka, there was an outside chance that Ferrari might be able to squeak a driver's championship out of it. However, the 056 engine in the back of Schumacher's car went pop, and that was the end of Schumacher's swan song season of maybe being able to retire with an 8th World Championship. However, the 248 on the balance of the season was a good car. It was a tremendous improvement over the F2005 of the 2005 season, and really the 248 and really the F2007 as well, they represent an evolutionary period of design going all the way back to the F2002 for the 2002 season for Ferrari. So Ferrari, obviously having a very dominant period in this era, from 1999 through 2004, winning the Constructors' Championship every year. They had a good thing going, and 2002 was their most dominant season to date, and still their most dominant season now, in 2023. However, that was a good design, so rather than throw everything away for the next year, Ferrari decided, let's develop the F2002 concept, and here in 2007, we're still very much doing that here on F2007. What is the F2007 then? Well, it is the Formula One car with which Ferrari competed in the 2007 Formula One World Championship. It was designed, built, and raced only by Scuderia Ferrari. The designers, in principle, of this car, executive technical director was Mario Almondo. He was helped by Aldo Costa in the design and development department for Ferrari. Nicolas Tombasis is listed as chief designer overall on the project, though. We also have names like Simone Resta, Jean Illy, Marca De Luca, and Jill Simon on the design roster for the F2007. So we have heard these names time and time again, and several of these names are still in Formula One to this day. The car, as we mentioned, was immediately preceded 
in 2006 by the 248F1, and it would be succeeded in 2008 by the F2008. Mid-2000s Formula One design, what do we have here technically in terms of chassis construction? Carbon fiber galore. We've got that carbon composite honeycomb monocoque forming the structural core of the car. That's comprising the cockpit, the front suspension mounts, the mounting pylons for the fuel tank behind the cockpit. So everything on the car is a stressed member from the back of the nose cone where it links up to the front of the monocoque all the way out to the gearbox and rear suspension. That's all forming the structural spine of the car to which everything else is mounted. Incredibly rigid, incredibly strong, and of course safety being the name of the game here really starting after 1994, but by this point in the mid-2000s, the Formula One designs that had really been started in about 1995 were really reaching maturity, and these cars were becoming impenetrable fortresses in terms of crash resilience, and carbon composites playing no small part in that, and of course, bringing that together to form that structural spine of the car. You're mounting everything to the cockpit, basically which means that in accident situations, things start to come off and dissipate energy and bring it away from the driver. All possible due to carbon composites, probably the biggest technical leap ever made in motorsport. Our suspension on this car though, we mentioned that suspension on the front anyway, mounting directly to that monocoque, and indeed it does. The front suspension, double wishbone, push rod. Very conventional, and we still see this today in Formula One. It worked then, and it continues to work now. This is, though, and we'll point this out later on, this is what we call a zero-keel car. And this was something that was made possible by advancements in carbon composites in this era. And the keel of the car is a flange that used to extend down from the bottom of the monocoque on the front end, to which the lower wishbones of the front suspension were mounted. And we'll illustrate how this is a zero-keel car later on when we're able to get a little bit closer. Rear suspension on the car, it is also a double wishbone push rod. We have rotary dampers that are attaching to those push rods on the rear, and we just have inboard coil spring dampers on the front end. So those are the predominant differences between the front and rear suspension on F2007. But same overall configuration, double wishbone, push rod, front and rear, no pull rod suspensions in this era on any of the Formula One cars. The engine in this car, it is the Ferrari Type 056, the same engine basically that was run in 2006 and developed for the 2006 season and now continuing to be used under the engine freeze for 2007. It is a 2.4 liter naturally aspirated V8 with a 90 degree bank angle mounted longitudinally as a stressed member in the construction. The engine is mated directly to a 7 speed plus reverse semi-automatic paddle shift electro hydraulically actuated sequential transmission, 7 forward gears, 1 reverse gear and a neutral in the middle, everybody in 2007 running a 7 speed gearbox. 2006 was the last time that we would have anybody even playing with a 6 speed gearbox, but 2005 was the last time that anyone actually ran one in a race situation. So by 2007 everybody had basically standardized and agreed on the 7 speed gearboxes for Formula 1 cars. Everybody was running one at this point. Overall power figures on this engine a little bit easier to come by nowadays than they were then, uh, particularly because these engines were around for so long, but 750 to 800 horsepower are the conservative figures. Somewhere around 810 to 830 horsepower are the more optimistic figures, but regardless, the power was coming in right at about 19,000 RPM, which was the rev limit in this era. The fuel, as the sponsors would belie, provided by Shell in their V-Power specification of high-grade fuel, and the tires were the Bridgestone Potenzas, the controlled tire specification for this era. The competition history, as we mentioned, the car was only entered by Ferrari in the 2007 season. It was driven by Felipe Massa and Kimi Raikkonen. Massa basically inheriting the on-paper team leader role, although Raikkonen really was coming in to replace Schumacher. However, the car's debut came at the 2007 Australian Grand Prix, which was promptly won by Kimi Raikkonen and solidified Ferrari's team order for 2007. The car entered 17 races. Out of those 17 races, it won 9 of them. It took 22 total podium finishes, 9 pole positions, and 12 fastest laps. This car is the last Ferrari to win a driver's championship 
It took that in 2007 with Kimi Raikkonen, and it also took a Constructors' Championship for Ferrari in 2007. The 2007 Constructors' Championship, it was not really a fight. It was a ceremonial proceeding for Ferrari to win it because McLaren had been disqualified from the Constructors' Championship in the fallout from the so-called Spygate extravaganza in which McLaren had been in possession of secret technical data about the Ferrari F2007 and they built a car that was designed to exceed the F2007's capabilities in every meaningful way. Therefore, Ferrari winning the Constructors' Championship ahead of BMW Sauber, believe it or not. So, an interesting season. People don't really remember 2007 for the Constructors' Championship fight because we really didn't get one. However, Kimi Raikkonen got his driver's title. It had been a long time coming, and eventually we're able to say now that the Formula One career of Kimi Raikkonen is complete, that he does manage to retire as a world champion, and of course it was very well deserved. Stopping our rotation and just taking an overall look at what's going on here on F2007. Those of you who remember Formula One in this era, this looks very familiar to you, I am sure. However, what's going on aerodynamically speaking? We know that in 2022, we had a seismic shift in the technical regulations to bring Formula One away from being a topside aero formula. So in other words, we're using wings and winglets and turning vanes and all sorts of bodywork appendages to generate downforce on top of the car. 2022 saw all of that downforce generation migrate from top side to bottom side using the under tray, using diffusers, using tunnels under the car to generate ground effect downforce. That was not at all the case in the mid 2000s. Formula One very much was a top side driven aero car in terms of how we're going to be generating aerodynamic downforce on the cars and you can readily see that here on the F2007 everywhere you look we have some sort of appendage someplace on this car designed either to steer air towards places that will generate downforce or appendages designed outright to produce downforce so everywhere you look there is a winglet there is a strake there is a turning vane there is something that's designed to give more downforce and this begins right here on the front wing you can see this front wing, in some respects, looks very simplistic relative to the front wings that we were seeing toward the end of the uh, 2010s decade, 2017 through 2019, and certainly very, very simplistic compared to what we saw in 2018, where we probably had the zenith of all of this. But even, even nowadays, we saw in 2022, the team's doing interesting things with their wings, despite the FIA's best efforts to simplify them. But here, we have an entirely different idea. We have basically a double wing. We have a main plane, as you can see, and that's the lower section of the wing, the leading edge of which is quite uh, apparent there. But we also have this upper element. This upper element, we call this a bridge wing. And this is something that McLaren started to play with very controversially in the 2007 season. But these bridge wing elements, this was something that Ferrari brought out and they did it in early 2006 on the 248. Basically, these upper elements that attach on either side of the nose and then they attach to the end fence here, they're just here as extra downforce generation. The flap angles would be adjustable and they're designed to create more downforce, more bang for your buck in the same cross-sectional area laterally on your front wing than you would get just from the standard main plane down here in this area. So that's what that was. The team's Basically, all the teams by the end of the season were starting to run a bridge wing of some sort, and this really went crazy in 2008. But um, the teams played with this in various solutions. Ferrari obviously going for a double element here, one element on each side of the nose cone. McLaren did a single bridge element that spanned the entire width of the front wing. McLaren solution flexed a lot. I remember that was a little bit of a controversy in this era because from the onboard cameras, you could see it closing down a slot gap between the nose cone and the bottom of the bridge wing. So that was interesting. And the FIA eventually made them put a stay in there to stop it flexing so much. However, the teams were playing with this. This was a, basically a free area of development and the, uh, the teams were playing with it quite a lot. And it was just interesting to watch that process play out. And it's not something that we see all that much anymore in Formula One, which of course is a bit of a shame. But that was one area of intrigue in 2007. 
Additionally, though, you can see on this wing, you can see just how much lower it is in the center versus the outboard sides. Why is that? That's the spoon wing. That was something that really started to come about in 2005 when the FIA said that the minimum height of the rear wings, of the front wings rather, needed to come up. So the team said, okay, we'll do that. But do you mean the entire wing needs to come up or just parts of the wing? The FIA said, um, we didn't think about that. So that's where the spoon wing came in. And it's just this center section coming down to meet the ground as much as it can. Because again, the closer you can get your wing to the ground, the faster you need to accelerate air to pass through that gap. And when a fluid flow travels faster across an adjacent surface, it exerts a lower pressure because we've got these wings upside down relative to say an aircraft wing, that negative lift pushes the car down. And that's the idea. Other things that we can see here though on the front end, there's our front suspension, double wishbone push rod as you would expect to see. Nothing uh, too interesting there technical wise. However, heading back toward midships on the uh, front end of the car, We've got our barge boards here. Barge boards, again, they were a big talking point in the end of the 2010s decade, but they were an even bigger talking point in this era. Everybody ran them, everybody understood how they worked, and everybody was trying to exploit more, basically, freeboard space to put more barge boards in, in this center section of the front end around the flanks of the monocoque. And um, basically the big rationale of the barge boards was, let's get air funneled out of the car here around the um, center of the front end, and start to entrain it along the side of the car, along the reference plane area, and then of course to start to feed the top side of the diffuser back here. Additionally, you can see that we have got this winglet and turning vane assembly here. This is a combination radiator exhaust, so this is a chimney. You'd get hot air coming out of the radiator from this side, and then behind it, just a little bit out of sight here from our vantage point, is another winglet designed to generate a little bit more mid-body downforce. We've also got these ramps ahead of the rear tires, just designed to get some of that high speed flow away from the rear tires and cut down on drag and turbulence. And then of course we have our rear wing here. Additionally, we have got our diffuser, top side of the diffuser is here. Pretty complicated geometries in this era, nothing like we would see beginning in say 2009 with the double diffuser idea, but you do have a double diffuser of sorts on these cars, which we will of course explain a little bit later on when we take a look from the rear. But generally, that's what's going on here on F2007. Pretty conventional relative to what we were seeing in the mid-2000s, but very, very different from what we see in modern Formula One. Looking here at F2007 from square on, nose on, and here you can really see the geometry of that front wing, particularly that spoon profile. Additionally, you can see that we have two closed elements on this front wing main plane. We have a lower and upper flap, and then of course we have got our double bridge elements coming across from the nose cone on either side. So that's how the front wing is working. Additionally, you can see that we do have the uh, inverted U channels right here on the extreme outboard sides of the wing along the end fences. That's just to generate a little bit more low pressure to uh, cut down on drag going into those front wheels and tires which are just hanging out there in the airstream generating a lot of turbulence. Additionally though, you can see our pickup points for the front suspension, double wishbone push rod as is plainly evident there going into the size of the chassis and of course the dampers are all inside the chassis as you would expect. Coming up here as we start to look rearward on the car, first of all top side you can see that we have got a little inlet duct right here. This is for cockpit cooling exclusively and uh, that's just picking up some air to shove into the cockpit so that the driver doesn't start to get overheated. However, if we come back down, you will also start to see that we have got ourselves our radiator inlets on either side, right here and right here. And uh, you can just generally see what the suspension elements are trying to do with that. They are just attempting to get out of the way of the air as much as possible so that we get as laminar, as uninterrupted a flow as possible into the radiator matrices for maximum cooling because the bigger holes you put in the uh, facing surface of the airstream, the more inefficiencies you do start to develop and start to introduce on these cars. And it's something that, uh, it's a double-edged sword because you need the intake air for cooling, but you also don't need the intake air because, well, it's, it's drag, it's a performance loss. So the teams are always playing 
that uh, compromise game between cooling, reliability, and uh, of course aerodynamic efficiency. So it's something that uh, the teams just need to take into account, and of course they did very well. You can also see as we look a little bit higher up, we've got our mirrors mounted very far outboard on either side of F2007. This was something that Schumacher liked. And of course, Michael Schumacher would not be racing this car, although he did test it rather extensively. Uh, but I remember in 2005, on Schumacher's car only, Ferrari used to run the mirrors in two different positions. Um, and you would, sometimes you would even see Schumacher running one mirror in one position and the other mirror on the other side of the car in a different position. They basically played with putting the mirrors near the sides of the cockpit where you'd expect them conventionally and putting them outboard here. And sometimes on the F2005, Schumacher would be running one of each. Um, so it was something that he liked, and of course it was something that Ferrari started to use for aerodynamics as well. As you can see, depending on how you wanted to angle these mirror fairings, you would start to influence flow over the flick-ups ahead of the rear wheels, as well as maybe even in training some air toward the rear wing main plane. So you just little incremental gains, little incremental tweaks that you can make as well in this era, which is cool. Moving back, though, toward the engine air intake snorkel behind the driver's head in a conventional place, as you would expect to see it. Nothing really remarkable there. And, of course, we have got the T-bar camera mount there, painted highlighter yellow in this case to signify car number two on the team, although Raikkonen was, of course, the de facto team leader. Actually, your nose cone. You can see the cars uh, running relatively high noses in this era. You want the nose as high as possible so that you can get better grip, um, aerodynamically speaking, because if you get more air underneath the car, you then start to have more uh, possibilities to play with it. And of course, the more air you can funnel in, the more air you have to play with, the more downforce you can generate, etc. So that's what's going on. The teams would prefer to run high noses if they could, but particularly nowadays, the FIA really shies away from things like that, so we don't really see that design too much anymore. But there it was on F2007. Taking a look from the right flank of F2007, what do we see here? Well, just a little bit better of an idea of the overall proportion and configuration of a lot of the aerodynamic surfaces on a car. There's our front wing end fence, as we saw from the front earlier on, but now you can see the sides. There is a little bit of a winglet right here that's protruding out a little bit, as well as our vortex generator underneath. And uh, the uh, end fence itself, it's actually angled a bit inboard, because we're trying actually to send air inside of the front wheels, rather than the outwash that we were seeing later on, and particularly through the 2010s. Inwash was more so the name of the game here because we had these extensive barge boards to play with here. We wanted to use them rather than put them in a relative vacuum. So inwash was the name of the game and uh, obviously then we were creating outwash with the barge boards once we got into that center section of the front end of the car. Speaking of that center section of the front end of the car, there it is. We have got two barge boards. We have our primary barge boards here, these larger ones, and then we have these smaller lower ancillary barge boards underneath the front suspension directly. That was pretty par for the course, and that was something that we saw on basically all of the cars, with a couple exceptions going back to 2004, 2005, but by 2007, everybody was running a setup more or less like this. So it became basically the convention, if you will. Also here, can't quite see it from this angle, but you see this little protrusion here ahead of the primary barge board. This is actually the front of the floor, so we're just trying to generate a little bit more entrainment for the air because uh, we start to get into the side pod area just uh, to the side of the cockpit, and uh, this is where we have a channel to start feeding the top side of the diffuser. So we just want to start to suggest to the air a little bit earlier on, hey, you should go this way, and that's what we're doing. The cockpit area, as you can see, you can see the cockpit surround, this area right here, right next to the driver's head. This is a bit lower than it would be even for 2008, and uh, it was an interesting incident that occurred in 2007 that uh, made the FIA tell the teams you actually need to raise your cockpit surround a little bit. At the Australian Grand Prix in 2007, the first race of the year, Alex Wurtz in the Williams and David Coulthard in the Red Bull came together, and um, David Coulthard ran over the top of Alex Wurtz, and this area on the left side of Coulthard's car came within, 
I would say less than 12 inches, so less than about 30 centimeters away from the head of Alex Wurtz. And um, that was basically the wake-up call to the FIA to say these guys need a little bit more side protection in the cockpit. So they made the sides of the monocoque come up to about this level beginning in 2008. Not a huge change, um, but it was something to give the drivers a little bit more protection in the event of one car mounting another laterally like that. But really what it did was it gave them more soft things to run into with their head and their neck should they get a lateral impact into a barrier or something with the sudden stop. Because obviously inertia says the car stops, the body inside the car does not want to stop until it hits something by itself. So give the driver's head something soft to run into so that you can minimize head injuries in lateral impacts, which these cars were a bit weak in lateral crash protection for the drivers. This was something that uh, ultimately started to pay dividends uh, in the 2010s. I remember in the 2012 season with Perez having an accident at Monaco, very similar to uh, a scary incident that Carl Wendlinger had at Monaco in 1994, but Perez walked away from his incident with a mild concussion. Mika Hakkinen as well in 1995 at Adelaide, again, a very strong lateral impact and there was no cockpit surround really in that era and uh, his head hit the Armco barrier outside the car, his his neck had extended so much because of the G-force and his head actually hit the barrier. So that's really what's um, conspiring to, to create these changes on the cars and it's something that we start, started to see in 2008. So 2007, the last year for these lowered cockpit sides. However, everything else about this section of the car, very conventional compared to what you would have seen in, say, 2008 even, and certainly going back to 2006 through almost 2000, um, pretty conventional in terms of what you would see. We have got this turning vein here. A lot of these parts actually debuted on the 248F1 of 2006, but here in the launch spec of the 2007 car, we have them here already installed. Additionally, you can see here's our chimney and uh, flick up, our little auxiliary winglet combo. They are just one piece. Some teams uh, ran these as separate pieces and uh, obviously Ferrari decided just to integrate them all into one. And that's what we've got here on F2007. Also conventional here on F2007, the engine cover. You can see here how it's just a triangular engine cover, just sloping down from the maximum height of the car where the roll hoop and air snorkel is and then just sloping down toward the rear wing. We would see this start to change in 2007, first of all. Ferrari introduced a more squared off engine cover, I believe beginning at the Spanish Grand Prix, where rather than it just being strictly triangular, we had basically going out straight to this point and then it started to come down. So a little bit of a squared off engine cover. But for 2008, Renault were the first team to do this. The team started to run shark fins, and these were the fins that went back straight on, and then they would terminate about here and then turn back in and then resume what would have been the triangular profile on the engine cover. Those were the first iterations of shark fins in Formula One, and then by the uh, midway through 2009, we started to see the teams running shark fins that actually attached to the rear wing. But... This beginning of 2007, the last time for a long time that we saw traditional triangular engine covers on Formula One cars, and of course we've got one here on F2007. Continuing to move rearward though, we have our engine exhaust, right bank exhausting here, and then we have got our flick up here for um, just uh, to steer some of that air away from the rear wheel and tire, which of course is right here. Speaking of that rear wheel and tire, obviously you can see we've got the Bridgestone Potenza tire, but we also have this disc in front of it. What is that? This is uh, the, for the first manifestation of what uh, we've called in Formula One wheel fairings. What were these wheel fairings? Well, they weren't necessarily wheel fairings. They were actually designed to be part of the brake duct, even though they attached to the wheel and not to the brake duct, and they rotated with the wheel as well. These were basically extractors. These are air extractors trying to pull hot air out of the center of the wheel hub for brake cooling. The teams argued that the primary purpose of these devices was brake cooling, and therefore the FIA said, okay, you can keep them. Were there other benefits? Yes, particularly on the front axle. 
You can see here on the front axle of F2007, we just have wheels like you would expect. But later on in 2007, we started to see wheel fairings run on the front axles as well. Ferrari ran them, McLaren ran them, Renault ran them. Basically everybody by the 2009 season was running some version of wheel fairings, at least on the front axle, but also we saw them quite often on the rear as well. They were extracting hot air from the wheel hubs to help cool the brakes, but they were also creating outwash. So that's uh, one of the first ways that the team started to produce outwash with those wheel fairings. But we don't have the we don't have these wheel fairings on the front axle on F two thousand seven. We just have them on the rear axle here. By the end of the season, we had them on the front axle on this car as well. But just here, because the 248 F1 also ran these toward the end of the season in 2006, launch spec 2007 has these uh, wheel fairings as well. So, interesting. Finally, the rear wing from this view looks utterly conventional, looks almost identical to the rear wing on the 248 F1 actually, particularly from the end fence, and it's just what we had in this era. Nothing particularly remarkable about it. Um, you can see here the crease lines. These are actual corrugations and crenulations and curves in these wings. So the end fences were not just straight across like we would see in 2009, for example, but rather simplistic compared to what we see nowadays in Formula One where we don't even really have end fences anymore. So just different design trends as things change over time and uh, this is what it was in 07. From the rear now on F2007, what do we see here? Well, a couple things that are quite different from modern Formula One. First of all, and probably most obviously, you can see that we have got our engine exhaust outlets here, left bank and right bank. And uh, obviously this is a V8 engine, we have two banks of cylinders, meaning that we are going to have two exhaust pipes coming out the back if we want to do this most efficiently. Four into one collector pipes, and then it just gets shot out the back here on either side. The exhaust is just being rooted through free air, yes, but you can see that we have got these heat treated sections, the black bodywork here. We're trying to root this exhaust toward the center line of the car over the gearbox casing, which is right in this area, and then we are trying to accelerate through the gap between the rear wing main plane and the beam wing down here. So we've got obviously a little bit of blown exhaust going on, but we're doing it with the rear wing rather than diffusers, let's say, something that we would see starting in 2009. Additionally, we've got our rear suspension, double wishbone push rod that you can see. You can just see the push rods coming up on either side in these areas here. So double wishbone push rod, you can also see the lower wishbones on either side. We've got this auxiliary winglet ahead of the rear wing. This is something that we started to see in, I want to say, 2004. So nothing new here and still allowed under the 2007 regulations. And then, of course, we have our diffuser underneath. The diffuser, it is, I want to say it's a double diffuser, almost in the same vein as we would see in 2009 on the Braun, Williams, and Toyota. But we've got our primary level of the diffuser outside here with some strikes coming down to the ground, and then we have got our center tunnel of the diffuser where the air really expands and it gets shot out the back here. So lots of rear downforce coming from a diffuser, not, again, very dissimilar from what we saw in 2009 from some teams, but uh, here in 2007, the teams were all doing this for quite some time by this point, and uh, that's what we see here on the Ferrari. Additionally, we have got our rain light and rear crash structure. The rain light is attached to the rear crash structure. 2007 saw an increase in the overall size of the rear crash structure um, to be more along the uh, size of um, the dimensions that we see even today in Formula One. So again, more uh, changes to safety here in this era. Again, we're trying to add more crash protection and we're also just trying to uh, prevent unnecessary damage to these cars from smaller incidents as well. The smaller rear crash structures in the past, they were still attached to the gearbox casing, yes, but less space be, um, to absorb the energy from, let's say, a low speed rear impact. You could cause damage to your gearbox that way and you're out of the race. If you've got a bigger rear crash structure, you've got more room to dissipate energy and maybe you avoid significant damage to the car which means you can keep racing which is better for everybody involved so that's um, another change on the 2007 cars relative to 2006 and prior also here quite obviously from the shot we've got our rear tires here 13 inch wheels um, inside these tires on all four corners 
but you can see that the tires are grooved and grooved tires obviously nothing new to those of you who know but to anyone who doesn't know grooved tires they were a thing that were introduced uh, beginning in the 1998 season and it was just to cut down on cornering speeds the True slick tires. Uh, the last time the Formula One ran these before 2009 was the 1997 championship. And the feeling was at the time that around some corners on some circuits, the cornering speeds were just getting a little bit too high for the circuit infrastructure to support in terms of barriers and gravel traps and things like that. So the FIA said, let's, let's slow these cars down a little bit. Let's put grooves in the tire so we cut down on mechanical grip. Let's also shrink the track width of these cars a little bit. So going down from 2,000 millimeters to 1,800 millimeters, where we still are here for 2007. So those two changes combining to lower cornering speeds beginning in 1998. By this point, the teams had all figured out how to work with those grooved tires, and the cornering speeds were well in excess of anything that we had seen in 1997, even with the full slick tires. So these grooved tires were starting to become very redundant. The FIA knew it, and for 2009, slicks would return. But uh, we were still running the grooved tires in 2007, and I personally liked them. I liked that it made the cars a little bit skatey, and I uh, also just liked the aesthetic of it. It was very unique. No other series ran a grooved slick like this. And I just thought it was it was something that was uniquely Formula One, and I appreciated it. A lot of people didn't, and in hindsight, yes, I see why it was a little bit of a gimmick, but I thought it was cool, and uh, I would not really be complaining too much if we still had grooved tires in Formula One. But that was the case here in 2007. And here for continuity's sake, the left flank of F2007 well, the same detail, same characteristics that you'd see on the right side, duplicated here, of course, on the left, as the car is symmetrical. But there it is, and uh, you just see overall how nicely laid out everything is on this car. Very cohesive design. Obviously, uh, some of the differences that you get in a car like this versus a more modern one you don't get the sense that the entire car is functioning as a single aerodynamic piece. Think about uh, the Adrian Newey Red Bulls, for example. Um, this car is very much divided into zones, aerodynamically speaking. We are trying to, first of all, pick up the air with the front wing, trying to create some downforce that way. We're trying to put it in, a, in an okay enough place for the barge boards to pick it up. But once the barge boards do pick it up, now the barge boards are trying to shove it out to the sides so that we can try to entrain that air around the um, undercut area of the side pod. So that kind of is pretty cohesive. But then once we get to about this point on the car, now the objective is we need to send the air up. Just send it up. No matter where it is, we need to send it up because rear wing is here, so we need to create a downforce with that. And diffuser inlet is here, so we need to create downforce with that. But either way, the air needs to go up. So you can see this with this winglet up here trying to push air up. With these winglets ahead of the rear wheels trying to push air up. And then the rear wing, of course, works by pushing air up as well as accelerating it through the gap between the main plane and the beam wing. The diffuser as well works by pushing the air up as you get here. But it's completely different from what we're trying to do with the front end of the car with the front wing. So you don't get the sense that cars in this era were particularly efficient aerodynamically speaking, and they really weren't. The straight line speeds, particularly at the beginning of the V8 era at most circuits, unless they just completely took the wings off at a place like Monza, for example, the straight line speeds were pretty low, relatively speaking, of course. Um, the cornering speeds were pretty ridiculous, as you would expect from a Formula One car, but particularly when they were running in the wet, you could see just the enormous rooster tails that they, these guys would throw up. You could also see all of the outwash from the barge boards and later on from the wheel fairings across particularly the front axle. And we also saw it in terms of following distance when these guys were racing. Cars could not approach each other really at all through uh, any appreciable corners because just the way that the cars were manipulating the air was creating so much turbulence. And turbulence is drag, right? So not only did that turbulence spoil the air for the cars behind, but it also spoiled the performance for the car generating it. Because if you're generating turbulence, it means you're putting too much energy into the air, which means that that's energy wasted. That's straight line speed lost. That's horsepower from your engine that's devoted to turning air rather than pushing the car forward. So 
inefficiencies were everywhere on these cars, and they worked for their intended purposes, but you just get the sense, looking at one of these in hindsight, that the designs were not as good as they really could have been, or maybe arguably should have been, but they were playing to the design envelope, the regulatory envelope that existed in the era, and to those purposes, they did exactly what they needed to do. But nowadays, looking at these well removed from the era, it just appears to be a little bit clunky in some respects. And I love the aesthetic of these cars, I really do, but they were not the ultimate manifestation of efficiency from an aerodynamic perspective. Going freehand now on F2007, and a closer look at some of the details that perhaps we couldn't see quite as well before. However, here we are on the front wing, and you can see quite readily that double element uh, bridge wing design. And uh, it looks very unique relative to what we see in the modern era, just we don't see this anymore. The front wing obviously more narrow than we have in the present day, but a little bit more complex in terms of where the main elements of the wing are. Obviously, the outboard size of the modern wings are just an order of magnitude different than what we see on this. But the design is different, and uh, I liked it. It was, it was a really dramatic look um, in the day, and I do remember it fondly. It was really cool. Also, you can see that the main plane of the wing is attached to the nose cone via short pylons here. And they've got the Italian flag on them. I do appreciate that. Of course, Ferrari always full of national pride. On the nose cone itself, just a very traditionally shaped nose cone there, tapering to a blunt point, but a point nonetheless. Don't really see this anymore either. But um, yes, I do like that a lot. No step planes, no proboscis protrusions or anything like that. In this era, just nice clean lines on the front end of a Formula One car. I liked it a lot. Nice decal work as well. As far as the model goes, it's held up nicely over the years. Here's our front suspension, double wishbone, push rod, as you can readily see. Very cool. There we go. Wishbone, wishbone, push rod going up there. Very nice. You can also see the track rod and the uh, ball joints there because we have working steering on this model. Very nice. Toward the front of the monocoque, behind where the nose cone attaches, hatches for accessing the pedal box and then a duct for cockpit cooling, pitot array and antennas for your telemetry going back to the pits, and then to the cockpit area. There's a cockpit surround that we talked about um, being lower than it would be certainly on a modern car and uh, lower than it would be even for 2008. Beyond that we've got our mirror stalks and mirror fairings there and this little windscreen just ahead of the cockpit there does have a purpose of just sending the air up a little bit away out of the driver's face and toward the snorkel, but um, you can see they're just very minuscule, almost comical, but still seen on Formula One cars, believe it or not. Coming down here across the front end, there are the barge boards and the radiator inlets. Very cool. If we go above, you can see the overall plan on those barge boards. You can see the lower barge boards underneath the front suspension, and then you've got the primary barge boards here. And you can see some of the interesting geometries around the tongue and tea tray, as well as the leading edge of the floor there, those protrusions that we talked about. You can see with these strakes here how we're trying to pick up the air and turn it toward the reference plane here, which is this section. And uh, we're just trying to entrain it along the side pods there through that stereotypical Coke bottle shape. So that's all cool, and that's all, of course, what you see here. Very, very nice. You can get in to see a little bit of the tea tray in this area, so all of that's there. And it's uh, still basically the same dimensions as it would be on a car of the 2010s. Cool. And then the reference plane, the sculpted undercut side of the side pods right here, and then feeding that toward the diffuser area inside this gap. There's a little vertical stay holding up this winglet that we can see ahead of the rear tire. That's cool. And then the top side of the diffuser through the gap that uh, we're always talking about in terms of having empty space to play with. That's cool. Exhaust routing channel there through the rear wing. There's our little ancillary winglet bolted to the back of the engine cover. And then our rear wing proper with its pylons attaching it to the gearbox casing. The big end fences as well. And here are our corrugations and vents, our gills cut into the side pod bodywork there for cooling the uh, radiators as well as exhausting our combustion exhaust through the engine. You can see this heat treated section 
routing the exhaust toward the center line through the pylons holding up the rear wing and then over the rear crash structure very cool very very cool here's our air snorkel looking good and then here's our Kimi Raikkonen in the cockpit not bad detail you can see the seat belts they're just decals I mean remember this is a 2007 model of a 2007 car so it's showing its age a little bit but you can see they did a decent enough job on his helmet with his personal and team sponsors there it it's okay it's just okay it does the job I suppose there's your steering wheel same steering wheel as we have on the 248 F1 model from Mattel but uh, it's there and it's attached to the front wheels as well steering does work as you can see it's not the best and it binds up a little bit but it's there so I can't really complain too much and along the sides of the cockpit here there is a little Ferrari shield and Raikkonen right there so cool I appreciate the attention to detail on things like that and uh, well all in all not a bad little model of the F2007 and now looking into the cockpit from the right rear and we can see a little bit more detail on the steering wheel we don't have any screens or any proper switch detail on the steering wheel in terms of decals but we do have just some multicolor paint on some of the buttons I suppose you could call them on the steering wheel again it doesn't look particularly true to life but you do overall get the general shape of the Ferrari steering wheel in this era and this semicircular wheel would um, be seen for the last time on the Ferraris in 2007. 2008 Ferrari went to a rectangular one, uh, the general shape of which is still more or less being used today, although it has grown in size a little bit. But um, yes, uh, this is correct in terms of the shape of a 2007 Ferrari steering wheel, although the detail on it is not really all that correct at all. But it does the job. No other details, though, evident in the cockpit. There are no chassis plates or anything like that. It's just bare black plastic but it it does the job and it's it's quite simply all right i will settle for it it's not really that big of a deal however the rest of the car here just looking at the engine cover the paint on this one is pretty good as far as mattel models go it's held up nicely over the years the decals also have held up pretty nicely over the years little areas of paint loss in some of the plastic parts as you can see here but not too bad all in all, pretty good. Pretty, pretty good, I gotta say. The tires look okay. Some Mattel tires do not look okay at all, but these look alright. Um, you can see little areas of what would be, I suppose, wear on them. But still pretty shiny, I must say. Really cool. And this car has uh, had an awful long life in my collection, so it's been handled quite a lot, but still looking pretty nice I must say still lives in its original box so all in all good very very good indeed and uh, everything is still intact no major repairs ever had to be done on this one to this point so yes it's it's living a good life here and finally the under tray here on F2007 what do we have well first of all here's our front end and here's what we mean by zero keel you can see how the front suspension is just mounting directly into the side of the chassis and you see how where is it this area of the chassis is just flat that's zero keel in years gone by you would have had a little v-shaped protrusion here or some almost bulbous bow if you're talking about ship terminology protrusion coming down from the bottom of the monocoque here we have nothing it's just straight across it's flat that's zero keel that's what we mean by that however though we have got our front wing that looks cool see the underside of that our strakes and vortex generators here these two little winglets are actually blank camera mounts and then our ancillary barge boards underneath where the keel of the car would have been and then our primary barge boards in this section cool with little protrusions from either side of the t-tray moving back the reference plane and the step plane and then our rear expansion zone of the diffuser just with our strakes as you would expect to see nothing particularly remarkable there but you do have that central tunnel of the diffuser in the expansion zone cool Beyond that, uh, we just have our legal disclaimer warnings produced under license of Ferrari SPA, Ferrari the Prancing Horse Device, 
all associated logos and distinctive designs are trademarks of Ferrari SPA. Body designs of the Ferrari cars are protected as Ferrari property under design trademark and trade dress regulations. That's what that reads. Back here we have got Hot Wheels and China right there. And then lastly we have Ferrari F2007. We also have, of course, a nice carbon texturing on all the plastic surfaces on this car. I like that a lot. I remember being impressed by that when I first started to collect these Formula One models. So they did a nice job on that. And, of course, it's uh, held up nicely over time as well. So I do very much like that. And it just uh, it was something different. And uh, I had uh, a lot of model cars by this point uh, when I started to collect the Formula One models. But... These were a bit different, and uh, the, the one of the carbon one of the things about that carbon texturing was that it was different from the other models that I had, and it just added a little bit of a, a sense of them being a little bit special. So I liked that, and uh, I like that it's still noticeable today. It still holds up nicely. I do very much appreciate that. So there it was in one eighteenth scale by Mattel Hot Wheels, the Ferrari F two thousand seven. It is a car that is absolutely indicative of the era from which it hails. Mid-2000s Formula One design, really complicated aerodynamics topside. However, as we took a look at, you can just start to pick it apart a little bit and say, you know, maybe they could have been better. Maybe in terms of aerodynamic efficiency, the 2009 and beyond regulations actually got the teams to do things a little bit better. Again, lots and lots of controversial takes on my part there because I do have to say this is not quite my favorite era of Formula One, but it is certainly up there. I really appreciated these cars in the time that they were racing, and I still appreciate them now. I think they look absolutely great when I think of the term Formula One. This is the overall type of car, the overall shape of car that I think of. I do not at all think about the 2009 and beyond regulations, and I do not think at all about the 2022 and beyond regulations. I think about this overall plan, really complicated wings, uh, relatively short wheelbases, relatively narrow tracks. I even think about groove tires to an extent because this was the Formula One that I came to know as I was becoming a Formula One fan. So perhaps it's the rose-colored glasses bias in my particular viewpoint here, but I still do appreciate these cars for what they were. I did appreciate them at the time. Although nowadays, I do definitely do benefit from the perspective of hindsight to say, well... Yeah, there have been some subsequent designs that were objectively better than the cars were in this era. Be that as it may, though, I really do like this model. It's an older one. Again, it's a 2007 model of a 2007 car made in the period, made with the materials and techniques of the period, too. But it has survived very, very well. The paint still looks good. The decals, more or less, are still holding up, as you would expect. No real areas of cracking or loss. So I've got to say, great job by Mattel in 2007 producing this one. And what can I say? It is one of the last championship-winning Ferraris. And in terms of the driver's title, it is the last championship-winning Ferrari to date. So it's one that you absolutely have to have. Plus, if you're a Kimi Raikkonen fan, this is Kimi's World Championship year. This is the car with which he did it. So if you are at all a fan of Kimi Raikkonen, this is one that you've got to have in your collection if you are going to be in the market for 118 scale Formula One cars. 2007 was Kimi's year. Finally, after so many close calls, it finally happened in the most improbable of ways, in the words of the great Speed Channel commentator Bob Varsha. Kimi Raikkonen winning the world championship in 2007 by just one point. Doesn't get too much better than that if you're trying to write a really cool screenplay, and that's exactly what happened in the 2007 world championship. Lewis Hamilton looked like he was going to become the first ever rookie to win the world championship, but it was not to be one of the stalwart veterans rose to the occasion and claimed victory at the last possible moment. And, of course, Kimi Raikkonen with his Formula One career now well and truly concluded. He is an absolute legend in his own time. Until next time, though, I do thank you all very much for watching Ferrari Man 601 saying thank you very much. And, of course, we will see you soon.